December 1941. Pearl Harbor lies in ruins. But the arsenal of democracy strikes back, and within months, thousands of pilots will fly a plane built by automakers. A plane created with one purpose, to avenge Pearl Harbor. I can vividly remember everything about this. Over a half century ago, an unsettled world burst into flames. Years of depression and isolation had cultivated the perception that America was buffered from such distant world conflicts. However, as the war widened, America was forced together in a unity unprecedented in modern society. This collective spirit, intent on the achievement of one goal, would become known as the arsenal of democracy. There is perhaps no better living example to the arsenal of democracy than this Navy bomber known proudly as the Avenger. Forged by the hands of men and women, automakers and seamstresses, machinists and housewives, the Avenger is a monument to a time in American history when the people of an entire country dedicated their lives to achieve a single goal. America desperately needed the tools of war to support a generation uprooted to fight in a distant land. Left with no alternatives, the arsenal of democracy would answer the call. The Avenger was given its name while the billows of black smoke were still rising from the decimated Navy base of Pearl Harbor. To avenge the Japanese attack was the call of this torpedo bomber, and avenge it would, as Japanese battleships and German U-boats would be quick to realize. From the Battle of Midway through to the last day of the war, the mighty Avenger served not only as lethal Navy bomber, but constant reminder of what a united America could achieve. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese Navy launched over 360 planes from six carriers that were within striking distance of the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor. American servicemen and civilians at Pearl Harbor had no idea what was about to hit them. The Navy's Pacific Fleet units at the base comprised over 70 combat vessels and 24 auxiliaries, most of them moored for the weekend. Of eight battleships in the harbor, five were sunk, one severely damaged, and the other two hit. Two destroyers were also sunk, while 140 aircraft were destroyed with another 80 damaged. Luckily for the Navy, its three carriers were not in the harbor during the attack. However, the deaths of over 2,300 military personnel struck a nerve that would prompt a quick American entry into the war. Remember Pearl Harbor would remain the battle cry of the Navy's Pacific Fleet for the next four years. Exactly three months to the day before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the prototype of a new Navy torpedo bomber flew for the first time. The plane was Grumman's entry into a design competition intended to replace the aging torpedo bombers of the 30s. Although this prototype won the contract, there was one problem. Grumman was already mass-producing fighters, and its plants were reaching overload. As this new torpedo bomber began its production run, it was clear that eventually Grumman would need to find someone else to help build it. The day after Pearl Harbor, the U.S. government ordered a curtailment on all automobile production. Immediately, the assembly line shut down and thousands of auto workers became unemployed overnight. 
General Motors representatives scrambled to find government contracts in an effort to keep their plants open. In an effort to procure small contracts like making wheels for a bomber or wings for the P-47, GM got much more than they had expected. As a result, the auto company needed to form a new division. GM veteran Cliff Goad was made general manager of this new division. His son, Thomas Goad, remembers this rapid chain of events. They, were, they thought they had a potential to get the P-47 wing. And that was when the, the, uh, they happened to walk into the War Department, a member, someone from Linden, uh, this investigation team that was trying to find a contract. And uh, just at the right time that the government decided that Grumman had this neat new torpedo bomber, the Avenger, that they were starting to build and it was going to be the backbone of a Navy uh, carrier-based bomber. Desperate for a contract, General Motors accepted the challenge of making airplanes and the Eastern Aircraft Division of General Motors was born. The transition from making cars to making planes was a mammoth one. The ominous threat from the East touched a fear which transcended all levels of American society. The American perception of the Japanese Empire was that of an unrelenting military juggernaut determined to control the Pacific and beyond. An invasion of America was expected as newsreels of the ever-expanding Japanese war machine bombarded theaters around the country. For the American worker, this threat provided ample motivation to begin this most difficult task. She has spun around herself a web of powerful bases and major strongholds. Every base is supported Under by tremendous pressure, GM dedicated five plants from Terrytown, New York to Baltimore, Maryland. The first challenge was the conversion of these plants into airplane production. Of course, number one, you got to clean the plants out completely. Just move every piece of equipment out of them. You don't want to just scrap it because anything you can save, you want to put in a warehouse so you can, when the war is over, you know you're going to go back to building cars again. So you want to be able to save all the equipment so that you can set up again just as quickly after the war. Over five miles of conveyor equipment needed to be torn from the Linden, New Jersey plant alone. At the Trenton plant, an airfield was built to test planes as they rolled off the assembly line. But the Avenger was a massive plane, the largest carrier-based plane of its time. Therefore, several plants needed to be expanded just to fit it inside. In the case of the Linden, they had to have one section of the plant that they had to raise the roof. And so when they had the assembled airplane, that they could take it down through that bay with the tail sticking up in the air to be able to clear the overhead rafters. As GM officials scratched their heads over sprawling sheets of airplane blueprints supplied by Grumman, they realized that their greatest challenge would be finding people that could build an airplane. But they had to go and recruit from all over General Motors uh, engineers and people with skills in airplanes because the aircraft companies were not, they couldn't afford to let any of their people go. Uh, the government said that you couldn't. You had to build these airplanes with your own people and uh, you can learn as much as you can from the aircraft companies. Go visit them and see what they do, but you can't have any of their people because they need those people to build the planes they're already building. A great task was underway as men and women from around the country pulled together to make the tools of war. There was much work to be done and with war raging, there was little time. On June 4th, 1942, the Japanese Navy spearheaded their largest offensive since the attack on Pearl Harbor. This time, the target was the U.S.-held island of Midway. Unlike the attack on Pearl Harbor, U.S. forces knew that it was coming. Japanese planes were already well on their way to the island before the Americans had a chance to attack the enemy carriers. The Japanese attack on Midway Island was massive and unrelenting. For the United States, the Battle of Midway was a must-win situation. 
If the Japanese were not stopped, they would solidify a land base within striking distance of Hawaii, furthering their grip on the Pacific. Only days before the Japanese attack, six Grumman Avengers were sent to Midway Island. These six planes were the first Avengers to see action at the front. For two tense days, young Navy pilots, fresh out of an abbreviated training course, awaited their fateful call to duty. The rest of the torpedo bombers assigned to take on the Japanese fleet were the outmoded Douglas Devastators already aboard the USS Hornet. For torpedo bombers, the Battle of Midway was an outright disaster. Late in the morning of June 4th, deck handlers aboard the USS Hornet awaited the return of 15 Douglas Devastators that had left that morning to attack the enemy fleet. However, the men aboard the Hornet would never see their planes again. All 15 Devastators were shot down by Japanese Zeros, and only one pilot managed to survive. Of the six Avengers that left Midway that morning, five were shot down. In one day, Torpedo 8 had lost 20 planes and 44 men. Despite the decimation of Torpedo 8 at Midway, it is important to note that their sacrifices were not in vain. The hero of the Battle of Midway was a Navy dive bomber, the Douglas SBD, known on the carrier decks as the Dauntless. It's true that these dive bombers were responsible for sinking the Japanese carriers, but to say they could have done so without the presence of torpedo bombers ignores the facts and is a point which has eluded many historians. At the Battle of Midway, the torpedo bombers were the first to arrive. Immediately, Japanese Zeros swarmed the low-flying American planes while anti-aircraft gunners kept the advancing torpedo bombers in their sights. With all eyes fixed on the action near the surface of the ocean, the dive bombers swarmed down from above, taking the Japanese ships by storm. It was a classic high-low attack, and in the end, four Japanese carriers were destroyed. By the evening of June 4th, victory at Midway had been achieved. This was the turning point of the war in the Pacific. Back at General Motors, a very different battle was underway. It was the battle to get aircraft assembly lines moving. Automotive employees were still coming to terms with the elusive skill of building an airplane. And with much of the workforce off at war or already working in other plants, GM tapped a resource that during the war would become the backbone of their workforce, women. Even before the war, women had proven to be accomplished seamstresses and had long since dominated the labor force of the garment and textile industries. For seamstresses, the shift to airplane production was an easy one. Airplane wings and tail sections were made largely of fabric and women were used extensively in the sub-assembly of these parts. But in World War II, women would do much more than sew. Thus emerged Rosie the Riveter. It is unclear whether there ever was a true Rosie. She's really more of a mythical figure, a symbol of the American woman during World War II, a woman who put down the knitting needles and picked up a rivet gun, a woman who took off her bonnet and put on a welding mask, Rosie transcended all racial boundaries. She was both rich and poor and would work long hours with the sole intention of making a better plane that would be flown by her sons and brothers. Under the watchful eye of a concerned Navy, she drilled, sanded, riveted, and welded side by side with her male counterparts. Despite the dedication put forth by the employees of Eastern Aircraft, teaching automakers to build aircraft was an arduous process. To help this process along, Grumman supplied General Motors with two PK ships. Grumman engineers built an Avenger 
but instead of using rivets, they put the plane together with Parker Callon fasteners. They then shipped the plane to General Motors where the PK fasteners could be removed. The PK ships proved to be the valuable reference the automakers needed, and as the summer of 42 gave way to autumn, the Avengers at the GM plants were beginning to take shape. On November the 11th, 1942, an anxious crowd awaited the first flight of the GM-built Avenger. The first flight was crucial, not only because it would prove whether or not the plane worked, but it would show these automakers that they had truly built a machine that could fly. This is the TBM. The TB stands for Torpedo Bomber. The M was the Navy's designation for General Motors. The Avengers that flew at the Battle of Midway held the designation TBF, F being Grumman. Aside from the Navy designation, the Grumman TBF and the General Motors TBM are the exact same airplane. They had to be because the Navy ordered that their parts be interchangeable. Here the bomb bay doors can be seen in the open position. Within those doors would lie the torpedo known by Avenger pilots as the fish. The Avenger is a large airplane. A massive 1700 horsepower right engine was needed to get it off the carrier. Sturdy wheels designed to withstand punishing landings are the trademark of all Navy planes. This is especially true for the Avenger which was the largest carrier plane of World War II. The Avenger had three crew members. One sat in an electrically controlled ball gun turret towards the back of the fuselage. The pilot sat in front of a large greenhouse-style canopy, while the bombardier who released the torpedoes, bombs, depth charges, or mines sat in the rear at the back of the bomb bay doors. By the end of the war, close to 10,000 Avengers had been built, carrying almost 30,000 aviators into harm's way. One of these aviators was a young high school student named George Bush. On his 18th birthday, Bush passed up a college opportunity and enlisted with the Navy. He wanted to fly the Avenger. I chose torpedo bombers. I, I, I wasn't... Some of it was that I didn't think I was a particularly accomplished uh, fighter jockey, one of these guys doing all these uh, maneuvers. Secondly, the plane had great appeal to me. It was a team effort. There were three of us in the airplane. It was a stable aircraft. It was the largest carrier aircraft. So I asked to be trained for torpedo bombers, and I never regretted it. It was risky, of course, but uh, that just went with the territory in those days. After Bush got his wings in the summer of 43, he began training in his new Avenger, which he named Barbara after his girlfriend back home. Ensign Bush was assigned to Torpedo Squadron 51, deployed to the light carrier USS San Jacinto. One of the things that impressed Bush most about his new vocation was the teamwork involved both on and off the plane. You had a crew, you had a team, um, I don't know whether you can see this, but in the back of the, behind the pilot, there was a turret, and you had a turret gunner in there, and then in the bottom of the airplane, you had what they called a stinger gunner, or tail gunner, and uh, they helped keep the plane up. We'd wash our own airplane, uh, the, our crews. We had a, flight, a crew captain on the, on the deck, on the carrier, but it just came together. You got to know them well. You shared experiences with them, and I've always liked team sports, team effort, even in the White House. And uh, so I think it, that team concept had an appeal to me uh, when I decided to try for torpedo bombers as opposed to fighters. As with all naval aviators, Bush needed to get used to life on a boat, which can be treacherous. I guess my first recollection of the Pacific was these enormous high seas. And this was a converted cruiser hull, fast carrier. She ran with the big CVs. And uh, it, uh, it was hairy. I, one of our guys subsequently killed, turned absolutely green. I mean, you've heard of people get seasick and turn green. This guy was green. The seas were rough. He couldn't fly in a, that kind of weather. But again, it was just part of 
part of our maturing as a, as a squadron. Only days after George Bush enlisted with the Navy, the United States had begun an all-out offensive against the island of Guadalcanal. In September 1942, the first group of Avengers began to arrive at Henderson Field at Guadalcanal. The Avengers were part of an air group assigned to knock out Japanese shipping in the area. Although Avengers had only been in the service for three months, they had already earned a rather unflattering nickname. Marine Corps General George Dooley explains. It was called a turkey. And why was it called a turkey? Well, because it sort of looked like a turkey. It sort of lumbered through the air, and in comparison to the F6F Hellcat, which it closely resembled, it was not nearly as uh, attractive. During World War II, there was an urgent rush to get Avenger pilots and their crews to the South Pacific. General George Dooley had less than a month to get familiarized with his Avenger and his crew. Seeing an enemy aircraft coming, banded at 12 o'clock. Well, actually, it was a banded at 6 o'clock. Pilots were all looking at 12 o'clock, and suddenly we realized that he had gotten twisted around, but he made up for it by shooting down the aircraft. For American torpedo bombers, Japanese Zeros were only half the problem. In order for an Avenger to guarantee a successful torpedo run, they needed to go very low, easy targets for the gunners on the ship. If you're going in against an enemy that's shooting at you with everything that it has, uh, the one thing you're going to do is want to get a hit. As the Battle of Guadalcanal raged on, Navy planes began to strike powerful blows to the Japanese fleet. In a mere two-day period in November of 42, the Japanese lost two battleships, three destroyers, one cruiser, and 11 cargo vessels. General Dooley flew against the mighty Japanese battleship Kenugasa. getting to the torpedo release point, some gunner on the bow of the ship, the Kenyagasa, zeroed in on me and I had uh, uh, little red golf balls rolling all around my left side of my aircraft. I finally had to settle down getting to the torpedo release point. At this point, the gunners started hitting me uh, in the port wing and all you could hear was that as these shells were hitting home. We released and I went home and I, on the way home I nursed the aircraft very carefully, not knowing whether or not the wing was going to stay on. As it turned out, when we got home, the wing was very sturdy. It could have taken any number of Gs and still held up. The mistakes made at the Battle of Midway would not be made at Guadalcanal. Torpedo bombers now attacked ships with the full protection of Wildcat and Hellcat fighters lurking overhead. By early 1943, American naval fighters had learned the tactics of effectively taking on their skilled adversaries. It's true that sheer fighting experience improved American chances in their elite battles high above the clouds over the South Pacific. But it was really the emergence of a new fighter, the F-6F Hellcat, which would tip the balance to the American dogfighters. Since 1941, the Grumman Corporation had been concentrating on production of their new fighter, the F-6F Hellcat. 
which would be much more durable than its predecessor, the Wildcat. The government wanted Hellcats, and it wanted them quick. With the war escalating, Rosie was promoted from Riveter to pilot. The Women's Air Service Patrol, or WASP, was a group of highly skilled female pilots who delivered Hellcats to the West Coast to help fulfill the urgent demands of the Navy. Although never officially sanctioned by the Army Air Corps, they are a proud chapter in the long history of Grumman. By the summer of 1943, the Grumman Aircraft Company was dedicated almost exclusively to production of the coveted Hellcat. By this time, the U.S. Navy was not the only customer. England wanted them too. The Women's Air Service Patrol busily hurried the planes to Navy units on the West Coast as well as to the Royal Navy on provisions of Lend-Lease. By January 1944, Grumman stopped production of Avengers altogether, concentrating solely on the Hellcat. So confident was the Navy in General Motors that all of the Avenger production was now put into their hands. In December of 43, the 1,000th Avenger had rolled off the assembly line at the GM plant in Trenton, New Jersey. The next thousand would be produced in less than a third of the time. Eastern Aircraft General Manager Cliff Goad had developed such a respect among aircraft industry leaders such as Larry Bell, Donald Douglas, and Glenn Martin that he was named Chairman of the Aircraft War Production Council. Cliff Goad's son, Tom, also developed a new respect for aviation. We've lived and breathed airplanes, and I've made models of, of uh, the Wildcat and the Avenger, and, and I dreamed of being a Navy flyer someday. And, uh, uh, it was, it was very inspiring, you know. Allied victories at Guadalcanal and New Guinea had made it clear that the Japanese were on the defensive in the Pacific. U.S. naval forces had begun an island hopping campaign intended to secure communication and supply routes from Australia and establish air bases from which the airplanes could strike further into Japanese-held territory. With the island hopping campaign in full swing, Avenger squadrons found themselves being used in the close air support role for Marines landing on the beach. Each Avenger could carry four 500-pound bombs. Used against entrenched Japanese troops on the beachhead, a squadron of Avengers delivered a formidable punch. After days of bombardment that softened the Japanese defenses, the 7th Infantry Division and the 4th Marine Division landed on the Kwajalein Atoll. By the end of the first week of February, most of the resistance on Kwajalein had been overcome. The Navy had planned to move further into the Marshall Islands in mid-April, but Japanese resistance had been so weak at Kwajalein that further marine landings moved forward ahead of schedule. Searching for any remaining pockets of enemy resistance, U.S. Marines waded through the decimated landscape wrought by days of aerial bombardment from Navy Avengers. By the end of the Marshall Islands campaign, more than 600 Americans had been killed with 1,800 wounded, while Japanese casualties numbered over 9,000. Just two weeks after the landing, airstrips were constructed and Avenger squadrons were preparing for the final push towards Japan. In June of 1944, the U.S. fleet was consolidating their grip on Saipan and Guam. At the same time, one of the most historic battles of World War II was heating up. The Battle of the Philippine Sea was the largest aerial battle ever staged between two carrier forces. This showdown of naval aviators would become known to Americans as the Marianas Turkey Shoot. High in the skies over the Philippine Sea, the Hellcat fighter reigned supreme. 
On the first day alone, the Japanese Navy lost 156 planes to American fighters. To avoid confusing torpedo bombers with their Japanese counterparts, Hellcat pilots carried something that is usually considered a child's toy, model airplanes. The uh, Air Force, or the Army at that time, made uh, these, they're made out of a very hard plastic material, and they uh, used them to help train the pilots on identifying aircraft. They were normally just an all-black plastic, and they had these on, on all the Allied planes and all the, uh, the German and Japanese planes so that they could help uh, teach the uh, pilots and the aircraft gunners the various uh, airplanes so they could identify them. With a blanket protection of fighter cover, Avenger crews could concentrate more on dropping bombs and torpedoes than fending off Japanese Zeros. Relentless bombardment softened Japanese resistance, and by the end of June, nearly all of the Marianas Islands were under U.S. control. With the Marianas secured, the Navy was ready to move on to the crucial island of Guam. By late 1944, the Japanese forces were clinging to their last remaining outposts in the South Pacific. In October, the American fast carrier forces began their final push against the Japanese as they headed for Okinawa and Formosa. As the war in the Pacific dragged on, Avenger squadrons were used more for bombing missions than in torpedo attacks against Japanese shipping. From Luzon to Mindoro to the liberation of the Philippines, Avenger squadrons pounded relentlessly at an enemy that was quickly losing his grip on the war. In a last attempt to stop the onrushing American fleet, the Japanese reverted to desperate measures. Men of the U.S. Navy Escort Carrier Group, Taffy-1, were stunned to find Japanese aircraft plunging headlong toward their ships. This was the first Navy group to be subjected to the infamous kamikaze attacks. Blackening the skies with a fierce hail of anti-aircraft fire was the main defense against the suicide-bent pilots. And although a few managed to hit American ships, most kamikazes found only the ocean at the end of their dive. Undaunted by the new threat of the kamikazes, the American fleet pushed onward to the Bonin Islands, only 750 miles south of Tokyo. The main island of interest was Iwo Jima, which the Allies wanted to establish as a base for fighters that would later protect the B-29 slated to bomb Japan. In February and March of 45, Avengers were involved in the two Iwo Jima campaigns in the role of close air support for the Marines. Close air support was crucial, and after one of the most bitter struggles of the war, the victorious Marines raised the flag over Iwo Jima. Although the U.S. Navy was steadily winning the war in the Pacific, the daily challenges faced by naval aviators were unrelenting. Landing a plane on a carrier deck with only one wheel is not something Navy pilots had trained to do. It was something they had to learn on the job. In World War II, there were no ejection seats. If your plane was crippled, you had three choices. You could attempt to jump out, ditch the plane in the sea, or land on the carrier, as does this Hellcat pilot. Jumping out of a crippled plane was usually the last resort of any pilot. Parachutes were notably unreliable. And there was a risk of being hit by the tail of your plane on the way out. Landing on the water was generally a safer bet but only if the plane was responsive enough to turn up wind and be gently touched down. 
If the plane was still flyable, a carrier landing was the preferred option. But it too would be fatal. The danger of flight was something the automakers of General Motors had to persistently remind themselves of. Weight was no, no problem with a car. In fact, people liked the heavier car because it, they felt it, it rode uh, more safely. It was a better riding car. It was a safer car. But airplanes, every ounce of weight was very, very important because the lighter it is, the more it can carry, the more ammunition, the more guns. The better fighting machine it can be, the faster it can be. It's just a very different attitude. You had to build it light, strong, and rugged. The Avenger was rugged, and in the proud tradition of the Grumman Ironworks, it proved time and again that it could take significant abuse and still make it back to the ship. However, for Ensign George Bush of Torpedo Squadron 51, September 2nd, 1944, was a day when his Avenger would never make it back to the ship. Taking off from the USS San Jacinto that morning, Bush was embarking on a mission that would change his life. Well, it was a, it was a, you know, it was a momentous day in my life that I will never forget. September 2nd, 44, uh, early in the morning. Uh, we had flown over uh, Chichi Jima the day before, and uh, so we were to go back again the next day. The target was a heavily defended radio station. With the fleet moving south, the station had to be hit on this mission. This was the last day that the fleet was going to be under uh, Admiral Michener in the north. Task Force 58 was soon to become Task Force 38 under Admiral Halsey. So I knew that the, sh the fleet would, would be leaving that evening. We'd been told that. This is your last mission over the Bonin Islands. Fleet's going south. Uh, which came to haunt me later on when I was floating around in the water because I say, hey, if they're going south and I'm sitting up here, it won't be too good. On the way to the target, the four Avengers split into two pairs. Bush and his wingman would hit one radio station and the other two Avengers would attack another station. It was a rather clear day. Flew, climbed about uh, 10 or 12,000 feet. Uh, got the signal from our squadron leader to push over into a dive. We were doing what they call glide bombing. This plane was designed not to go st almost straight down like a, like a dive bomber, but in a glide. And uh, we were carrying four or five hundred pound bombs. My target was a radio station. And the minute we got over the target or near the target, we could see that we were in for a rather warm reception because the flak was all over these angry black puffs. And I pushed the plane over into a dive, and uh, about halfway down, uh, seeing this stuff breaking all around you, you, you could feel the plane go up like this, and suddenly it was engulfed in smoke and fire. And uh, I did manage to finish the bombing run and, and uh, pulled out over the ocean and uh, made a turn so that people in the back could get out. After giving his crew members time to jump out of the plane, Bush himself climbed out onto the wing. It was very scary. You couldn't hardly see the instruments. And I jumped and pulled the ripcord too early, and I hit my head on the tail of the airplane and ended up with a great big, like, a strawberry in baseball, you know, when you slide, just rip the skin off. And ironically, the chute had hung up on the, just for a moment, on the tail of the plane, ripped some of the uh, panels out of this high-cut parachute, and I looked up, I counted, I was dazed by that, came to, and there I was floating down into the Pacific. You could see the Japanese island right there very clearly. Uh, landed in there. Uh, I'd forgotten to hook my seat pack, and so one of the fighter pilots dove down and showed me where that was. I fl swam over and got it, uh, inflated it, climbed into the raft, and proceeded to set the record for the fastest uh, yellow raft in the history of the Pacific, trying to go away against the wind, away from this uh, island of Chichijima. A Hellcat pilot strafed a Japanese boat sent out to capture Bush, who was alone in a life raft with little protection. I was carrying a 38 caliber pistol. I knew enough about those islands to know that, that they were not kind to prisoners when they got them. In fact, the co commandant of that place was later tried on a war crimes trial and was hung for eating the liver of the pilots. 
So uh, I unflexed my 38, not knowing what the hell I'd do with it. And uh, fortunately, I didn't have to do someone else in or myself in it. After nearly three hours in the raft, Bush saw something emerge from the water 100 yards away. This footage was taken aboard the American submarine USS Finback when it rescued Bush from the waters off Chichijima. In 1945, General Motors built their 7,000th Avenger. Only four years earlier, they were making cars, and by the end of the war, they had produced over three quarters of all the Avengers for the Navy. This monumental conversion effort did not go unappreciated by President Truman, who visited the plant with the Secretary of Defense and a group of very grateful Navy admirals. Before Japan officially surrendered on September 2nd, 1945, Avengers were operating in airfields throughout Japan. From their tragic beginning at Midway to their successes against U-boats in the Atlantic and to their triumphant ending in Tokyo, the plane that came to symbolize the arsenal of democracy was there through it all. Could industries throughout America ever again come together as they did in World War II? Well, if we were told we can't build any more cars and we're going to have to do something with our people, I'm sure we would learn how to build whatever product the government wanted us to build to support whatever major effort to, we were going after to win a war or whatever it is. I think that's just the American spirit. The Avenger served with the Navy until 1955, but never again in a combat role. During the Korean War, it was used extensively for the transport of cargo from Japan to the fleet. With the onset of the Cold War, the Avenger landed an important role in the Navy's quest to hunt down Soviet submarines. Several other Avengers, such as the Sea Search variant that was fitted with a large searchlight in the bomb bay and the electronic countermeasures variant, flew briefly for the Navy. The Avenger still flies today. From Alabama to Arizona, the pilots of the Jet 8 generation fly through the peaceful skies in the living relic that once brought terror to Japanese ships and German U-boats. Now the Avenger sees most of its action at air shows and reunions, flown by pilots who carry on the legacy of an earlier time, a time when an unsettled world burst into flames a time when the industries of America pulled together in their own bitter struggle to become one strong and unified arsenal of democracy. Mm -hmm.